Well, new project now. Going to do a little chainsaw milling. I was hoping to have that done by now, but some stuff came up and I didn't quite get to it. We had some pretty nice weather here uh, a week ago. Kind of rough actually on us. It went from 45 degrees for a couple of weeks up to 80 degrees in two days. I was going to mill these logs up, but I had to plant a couple trees and to do that I had to dig out some dirt and fill an area for them and anyway it didn't wind up not getting done and then last week my brother and nephew and a couple friends came up from down in Washington to go fishing and they wound up wanting to work on a couple projects around here that I had to kind of ramrod for them or but I didn't ramrod it Joe our friend is the one that ramrodded it and did the building and stuff but I just had to chase parts down and uh, things like that to keep them going and then we had the boat here and I worked on the boat getting it ready to go out and go fishing. We managed to get it out for a day or two to go fishing on it. And I've also started working, started flying, not too much yet, but just enough to kind of interfere with the continuity of things. Anyway, things got a little bit delayed, but I'm going to get started on setting up this saw, uh, chainsaw now to do some chainsaw milling. I've got two big spruce logs out there that we salvaged from a blowdown here a couple years ago and I'd been hoping to get that mobile dimension sawmill up and running to cut those as they're too big to put on the band sawmill but I'm not going to get that mobile dimension sawmill going here anytime soon. I need some lumber for the house and some other projects. The guys when they were here they framed in the floor for the addition onto the house and I need some two by six material for rafters and things like that. I want to get those cut before I start putting the floor down and the walls up so I can get the roof over it right away without letting everything get all saturated with water. And like I said, those logs are too big to fit on the bandsaw mill. So what I'm going to do is break them down with the chainsaw mill into cants. Then I can put those cants on the sawmill and cut them down into the lumber I need. If I cut six inch cants off those logs then I can just whip out two by sixes. If I cut four inch cant I can whip out two by fours. I'm going to need some of each so I'm going to get busy and do that. So I've drug out my saw that I use for going to use for the sawmill. This is a Husqvarna 3120 and I did a lot of sawmilling with my old Husqvarna 480, which is a, uh, about an 80cc saw, but it's not quite big enough uh, for milling. And I wound up getting a Husqvarna 394, and that worked really good for milling. I milled almost all of the timber, all of the lumber and stuff that's in the house up with that uh, Husqvarna 394. And I've got a timber that is 14 by 12 by 35 feet long in the basement. I've got a whole bunch of 2 by 12 floor joists in the basement and rim joists around the house on both sides. They're full dimension uh, 2 by 12s and they were 24 to 35 feet long. I've got some 6 by 12 beams in the second floor, in the first floor, between the first floor and the second floor. I've got uh, a dozen of those or more. 2 by 8s for floor joists for the second floor and a bunch of miscellaneous lumber and stuff up there plus all the lumber that I use for the shop and a lot of it that's in the cabin and anyway I milled up a lot of lumber with the chainsaw mill with that 394 but it was starting to get pretty well worn I figured it was getting worn out and this Husqvarna 3120 came up for sale I think somebody had it down in Florida or down in uh, south someplace after a hurricane and they didn't get used very much and it was cheap and I, I wound up buying bidding on it on eBay and I actually got it for less money than what I sold the 394 for. I haven't been used it for uh, saw milling because we got the band saw mill and I mostly used that. I've used it quite a bit to cut some big trees down and cut up some big trees like, like those logs that I've got out there. I cut those with this and I've cut some big yellow cedar and stuff like that. But it's been sitting under the bench for a couple years now. I think the last time I used it was to cut uh, down a yellow cedar log that was too wide to fit on the sawmill and I had to cut the jug butt down on it so I could get it on the mill to fit over it. I think that was the last time I used it. So Anyway, I've got it dug out, sitting on the bench. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, start that up and make sure it runs, make sure it doesn't need any work to it before 
to the engine or anything for it running before I uh, uh, start setting that sawmill up on it. Well, I've got a 42 inch cannon bar on it and a 404 uh, chain. I think cannon is probably one of the number one bars you can buy. I think there's one that comes out of Australia or Japan, the Sugara or something like that, that is a equivalent to these. It's a really good bar. A lot better than one of the bars that I had, a GB bar. That was supposed to be a good bar, but uh, those things sucked. Okay, so this thing is set for quite a while. It's got old gas in it. It might take a little bit to get it started. And uh, I'm going to take it out to where I can set it on a log and not have to bend over to pull on it. I'll hold it and start it. Well, the starter's acting up on that. I could tell that when it was sitting there on the floor trying to start it. I thought that was what was wrong, but I wasn't sure. And once I got it out on the log and set it up there and tried to start it, I could tell that starter was not engaging right. So I'm going to have to pull a uh, starter off of there, see what we can do with that. That's why we'll check it out before we put the paraphernalia on it and go out and try to cut with it. So anyway, I got some work to do on it. Somehow this starter rope got wrapped around this pawl here, this ratchet for engaging the starter, and it took several wraps around it and was tight binding up in there. So that's not supposed to do that. Anyway, it's pulled back out into the uh, where it's supposed to be now. It's got a little tab hanging out there. I'm going to have to cut that off, probably get a lighter or something and, and melt that down so it doesn't do that again. Now it's working a lot better now. Okay, that's better. Had a heck of a time with that thing. First time I was pulling on it, it was just dragging like heck in there and I could look down through the fins, uh, the cooling fins on that cover, on that starter cover, and I could see the rope cut wrapped around on the starter. I remember now that back when I was using it, I don't know, two or three times back, I was up in the woods, the knot on the starter broke and the uh, rope came out and I put it back together you know, what was wound up shorter and I was always going to put another starter rope in there but anyway I didn't and then that knot was sticking out far enough that it caught on that ratchet on that uh, starter pawl. So I got to looking around and found uh, a length of uh, starter rope and fitted that in there and I was having a heck of a time getting it started. Well I forgot on this saw you got to pull the throttle open and then there's a pin you push in to lock the throttle part way open and when I finally figured that out then I was able to get it started in about three pulls then. So most of these new saws now when you put the choke on it automatically sets the throttle at a fast idle or high idle speed and then even when you take the choke off it'll leave it at a high idle speed until the engine starts running on there but this is an older style saw it uh, it doesn't have that on the on the choke or on the starter you got to pull this throttle open and and lock it open and then you got to push the compression release in every time it pops a little bit because uh, it's got so much compression in it you can't hardly pull it over by hand. And, uh, this is one of the few saws left around that still has a, an oiler button on it where you can oil the saw while you're running it. It has an automatic oiler too but um, it's made for running long bars where you might need extra oil on it. So uh, anyway we got it started and got it running and when my brother was here, we had some logs here that we'd cut, some trees we'd cut down here earlier this spring that were laying here. And my nephew had never run a chainsaw before, so we, we taught him how to run a chainsaw and he bucked those uh, logs up into firewood. Well, my wife was just picking up the last of the rounds and she found one round there that wasn't sawed through all the way. So I had the big saw out and cut it right off. Oh, that thing cuts like a raped ape. Big, big shavings on that thing. 
and it still needs to be sharpened up. I haven't sharpened it since the last time I used it or, or tuned it up or anything. It's not exactly perfectly sharp. But Anyway, now that chain will come off of there. I've got to go find my rip chain and put it on and uh, set up the, the sawmill bar, sawmill set up on stuff on there. So, But it's running. That's good. I'm glad I did that before I tried putting that uh, mill stuff on there because that would have is a lot harder to work on when you got all that crap on there. So. All right, I thought I had a rip chain already set up for this saw, but I don't. The one I have set up is for the other saw, the 394, and it's a 3 8 inch pitch chain and 50 gauge. And this is a 404 chain and 63 gauge. So I can either file this one for a rip chain or I can order a rip chain for it. If I file it it'll take me an hour or so, a couple hour or so to file it. If I order one it might take a couple of days. You know, I filed my own rip chains before and they work just fine. Normally they're fire, filed between 30 and 35 degrees at an angle this way and to do a rip to file it yourself you file it at zero degrees or ten degrees but for the commercially available rip chains, what they'll do is they'll take a tooth on each side and they'll cut off the top plate of the tooth and make it into a raker. And then the next two teeth, they'll file at zero degrees. Filing one myself, I can make it work. And it works pretty good. But the commercially one, commercial ones like that work a little better in my opinion. I hate to mess with this chain. I'm going to go get the ladder out and look through my chain supply and see what I've got there for chain. If I've got more chain of this uh, 404 63 gauge chain, maybe I'll go ahead and, and uh, grind one for ripping. That's 404 chain there, the roll of uh, Oregon. That's 63 gauge, so that would work. So that's three eighths, but that won't work on this sprocket or this uh, bar. They're both uh, 404 pitch, so the three eighths won't work on it. And this is some that I bought on sale a year ago when we were down south, and it's uh, 40, 404 63 gauge, but it's full comp. You see, full comp, it's got a lot of teeth on it. It's got one space between each tooth on there. And this on the uh, Oregon is semi-skip. So you've got two links in between each one of the cutter teeth on it, which uh, makes it pull easier. It cuts, actually cuts faster. You would think that with full comp chain like this, with a tooth, with one space between each tooth, you've got more teeth there. You think that would cut faster, but on a long bar, especially ripping, it's actually going to cut slower because there's not enough room in there. There's much room in there to clear the chips, and it's also putting more drag or more pull on the saw. So I don't think I'm going to use that. Actually, I bought this stuff to make up chains to sell. You got presets in there and everything. Oh, I don't know whether I got any presets, any uh, rivets for, I think I do, I must have, for the, there's not, oh, wait a minute, was, was there, there was some in the box, it was the still, it was the still um, 3 eighths that I don't have any presets for uh, in the box. There's presets for this in the box. Let's see. Yeah, here they are right here. All right, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make up a chain out of this Oregon chain and file it for ripping. Um, yeah, 
that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and and uh, regrind this chain. Actually, I've got a chain grinder I've never used for sharpening these. A bench grinder I could set up. Grind it with the bench grinder. Let me think about that for a minute or two. Well, this is a bench grinder. This happens to be a Tacomic. Oregon sells it to say the same thing. But you take the chain off the bar and run it through here and sharpen it. An electric grinder. I've never used one before. I bought this several years ago at the local hardware store. They'd had it in a box and it was missing some parts in it. And I got it for a really good price. Uh, I think 15 or 20 bucks or something like that. They sell for a hundred, couple hundred bucks. I don't know exactly what they sell for. But anyway, like I said, I got it for a good price. And I, I, it was missing a bolt here, back here. I made up new bolts, a new bolt for it that adjusts the, the angle, this angle. Uh, I've never mounted a stone in it. I've never used it. I've never used a grinder before. I started filing chainsaws when I was about seven or eight years old, in about 1958 or 59, something like that, by hand. And I've been filing by hand ever since. Uh, I know a lot of the professional cutters uh, in, around on the coast especially and up here I have sylvie grinders and grinders of different kind and they carry three or four chains with them when they go out in the woods and they just pull the chain off when it starts getting dull and put another chain on and then bring them all in and cut and uh, grind them up and at night when they come off work but my dad didn't do that we never did do that whenever a chain would get dull we just go ahead and file it in the woods take just about as long to file one as it took to smoke a cigarette put gas and oil in it and go. Anyway, I might try that. Oh, I gotta find a stone for that and get it all set up too. I don't know. I've got this chain filed for the square square file, square cut, the chisel chain cut. I have to think about that again and decide whether I want to go ahead and make up a uh, regular chain. Uh, I don't know yet. I just got to think about this. Got to think about this. You can see that chain was pretty well wore out to start with. Oh, maybe I got all those now. Nope, not yet. That's the last one. Okay, that's the last one on that side. That one actually looks a little longer than the rest of them. Alright, now i got to figure out how to turn this thing around the other way and make sure I get my tooth length the same length, the same amount of, of uh, tooth cut off on both sides. I kind of have to search through my memory. To, it's been so long since I've done this milling with a chainsaw that I've kind of forgotten. This is a commercially bought uh, chain for ripping. Now somebody's modified it like this but you can buy a roll of it like this so somebody's manufacturing these. I, I don't know whether it's the company that makes the chain like Oregon or Still or whoever makes the chain that does that or it's aftermarket that's done but this is what they do is this is one of the teeth here and the top plate has been cut off on it. So you'll have two of them in a row here where the top plate has been cut off and then you'll have two of them in a row where the top plate is, is still on there at full tooth. Now these two teeth with the top plate cut off they're filed at 20 degree angle this way and the intention here is that these gouge down in the side of the cut and then these teeth come through and scoop that 
out. So these two teeth here are filed at zero degrees straight across and again these two are filed at 20 degrees so they'll cut down in a little deeper and these scoop it out. So this is a full comp chain. You can see it's got one link uh, between each one of the teeth. It's a 3 8 inch pitch chain which means well the way you measure the chain is you measure between three rivets here and then divide it in half. So that's 375 or 3 8. Now this one is the one I just sharpened on the sharpener so it was wore out when I put it up there and, and it's I mean it's had its life out of it before I even started sharpening it. So this is a semi semi skip tooth chain so it's got two links in between each cutting te tooth. It's still a 3 8 inch pitch chain so there's still it's a 375 chain and these are also 50 gauge. 50 gauge is the thickness of the drive tang down here so it's 50 thousandths thick. There's several different gauges but the common ones for commercial saws are 50 gauge, 58 gauge, and 63 gauge. So this is a 50 gauge which means the bar slot is narrower and these are 50 thousandths and this was ground at a 10 degree angle this way. Let's see, chain goes this way flat like that and it's grounded at a 10 degree angle this way. Now normally uh, like I said, if you're doing hardwood, you would grind it about 30 degrees, and for softwood, about 35 degrees. Most everything I've ever done is 35 degrees. I'm on the west coast, and almost everything here is softwood. And then there's a full skip chain, and full skip chain just has another link, uh, another drive link between it and the next in the teeth between the two cutting teeth. So the longer the bars. Uh, the more skip you want on your and, and uh, power, it's it's a ratio between bar length and power. Um, but the longer the bar is, and the softer the wood, uh, spruce, pine, things like that have create big chips. So you need a lot of chip clearance. So with a long bar, you want a full skip chain. If the bar is not quite so long, then you can go with a semi skip chain. And again, it depends on the ratio of the power to the bar length. So the lower the horsepower you've got, the less drag you want. So you want, for a longer bar, you're going to want a semi-skip. So like most saws, 60cc type saws, 50cc type saws with a 24-inch bar, you can go a 24-inch bar is kind of stretching on a, on a 50cc, but a 60cc 24-inch uh, bar, you could go with a full a comp chain. Uh, if you want above that, you want to go with a semi-skip. 70 cc is the same way you want to go say a 28 inch bar you could go for cool comp I go semi skip on it though uh, it makes it cut a lot faster well I think I'm going to go find another old beater chain and practice some more on this but I think what's going to happen is I'm going to set the chain up and grind it initially on the grinder and then I'll probably file it by hand after that because I think I get a sharper edge on it if I file it by hand yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Grind those at 10 degrees. That's what I did, I've done before on those when I hand filed my own chain. I've got a new chain made up and I got the grinder set up. I've got this set for 55 degrees. I had it set at 50 before. They recommend 60, but that didn't seem like it to me it was getting enough uh, undercut, enough of an angle underneath there. Now you don't want too much of an angle or the top of the tooth will get dull faster but you've got to have enough to where it's hook, uh, you don't want a hook on it but for uh, rip saw you want a little more of a hook than you do for cross cutting so anyway I've got it set up for 55 degrees I also have this uh, uh, table this clamp here set up for 10 degrees uh, angle this way uh, which is kind of what I usually do with a uh, file anyway well, anyway, I guess I'm ready to go ahead and start sharpening. Uh, I've got quite a bit to take off of this, so it's going to go kind of slow. I'm not going to take off very much at one time here on each one of these teeth, so I'm going to have to go around the tooth, around the chain once, taking off a little bit, change my angle over uh, to take a little bit off of the other tooth, and then increase the depth of cut on the tooth and go back over it one again. 
and then swap it around and just keep doing that until I get it to go back to where I want it. I don't want to take it all off at once. Uh, and this is where the chain spliced together here because there's so there's a uh, longer space between them here. That's about as close as I can focus on it right there, but you can see how that uh, tip there is starting to square up. Well there, that has a sharp point on it right there. That's ideal for cutting, cross-cutting. Now that's taking that sharp point off of that tip of that tooth now. And I'm just doing it a little bit at a time. I don't, like I said, I don't want to burn the tooth. Alright, I've got that one done. But I'm going to go ahead and come around to where that splice was in that chain and use that for my reference point. This thing isn't quite as consistent as a person would think it'd be. Now I got to change the angle, uh, two angles on the grinder. I'll change uh, this guide here over to 10 degrees the other way, and then I'll tip it 10 degrees uh, the other direction too. What I want to do is get to the point where the front of this tooth is is uh, the same angle all the way across it here. I guess that chain sharpened. That went pretty good. Did a little bit at a time, go slow in it. I didn't burn any of the teeth like I did on that one, one that I used for practice, but there wasn't any metal left on, there was hardly any metal left on that one that I did for the practice. The teeth were just about gone, so there wasn't a lot to absorb the heat. But I just uh, went slow on these, and then once I went down the tooth, I went ahead and move the grinder up and down a little bit to try to take the burrs off of it and stuff and do a final hone on it. And it looks like it's going to work out pretty well. See how it works? In the wood, that's the, that's the tail. I'll get that back on the saw and start getting the sawmill uh, set up on it. Alright, so we've got a brand new chain on there now. Let's see, make sure that that, yeah, that works the way it's supposed to. So I got that tightened up to about the proper level. Well, I'm going to take it out now, start the saw up, and uh, run it a little bit, maybe put it in a piece of wood, and that, because that's a brand new chain, that's going to stretch a little bit as we get it going. Well, that thing cuts like a son of a gun now. It damn near pulled me off my feet, and that was cut and cross cut with this chain ground the way it is. I stuck it in a chunk of firewood to do a rip on it. Oh yeah, and it just tears it up. Like I said, it'll damn near pull you off your feet if you're not hanging on. So you can see how much that chain just just loosened up just from using it there as a brand new chain. It's going to loosen up even more as I use it. They always loosen up a little bit when you first put them on. So let me tighten that back up again. And they're ready to start setting that up for the for the mill.